So uh, <coughs> first of all, thanks to the organizers for letting me present part of uh, my current work, something that I has been doing as a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen, uh, working under the ERC grant of Oliver Gressel, who is my PhD advisor. And uh, today I'm gonna <coughs> talk about the recent work that I has been doing in collaboration with Paolo Benito Shambai and Martin Pes. And <coughs> the work is about a multi-fluid project that we have that Paolo was mentioning something yesterday during the numerical session, and I wanna comment about this. And after, I wanna show some applications to protoplanetary that might be interesting. So th the bas basic idea is to have a framework where we can <coughs> solve the equations for multiple species, and we eventually can include the mass transfer between different species and the momentum transfer. So <coughs> I keep this uh, quite simple today, such including continuity and momentum equation. Uh, <coughs> but it's something that you can uh, basically extend if you want to do some non-ideal MHD, for example, problems adding the ions and the electrons. Uh, <coughs> or you can add as well the energy equation. But so far, we're going to only focus on these two equations. So <coughs> uh, basically, in the continuity equation, what we could have is a mass transfer between different species. And in the momentum equation, uh, <coughs> I want to keep your attention to the momentum, the transfer of momentum, basically, the momentum transfer between different species. So <coughs> I'm going to talk about that. I'm uh, what we are assuming now is that the, the drag force is given by uh, this expression that depends on the velocity difference and has some collision rate, alpha, which in principle is a function of the density and the velocities of the different species. So <coughs> the, the question is, uh, how do we solve these equations uh, to, so to do some astrophysics, right? And how to do we solve it numerically? So um, I'm only going to talk about how do we solve the uh, momentum transfer. So th this only contribution to the momentum equation. And <coughs> I'm not showing here the pressure and the other terms in the momentum equation, and I will later explain why we are doing this. But it's related with the <coughs> operator splitting technique that we are using in Fargo 3D. But nevertheless, uh, you can think about that you have a problem where you want to solve this equation and focus on that point for the moment. So <coughs> what we did was a very simple simple thing. Maybe the most simple thing you can do is an implicit numerical scheme. Uh, so this only has, uh, so basically this is the equation that I was showing in the previous slide, but discretized in time. There's no any special derivative. There's no any special discretization. So <coughs> when you discretize this in time, you have some, uh, and you have an in index that give you the, the times that where you're integrating basically the, the equation. And <coughs> when you do it implicitly, that means that the update follow this, this kind of rule where the velocity in the time step that you want to solve it, it depends uh, on itself on that time step. So you need to solve the system uh, algebraically uh, and then you have to invert the a matrix. So you have to move around stuff in order to solve it. But this is the generic expression. And we are assuming that the collision rate is given in the time step, <coughs> in the previous time step, right? So if it does depend on the density of the velocity, you assume that you are not going to uh, put an implicit coefficient here, basically. So <coughs> uh, this is very interesting because it has many, many uh, interesting properties that are very important when you want to solve numerically. One of those that those properties is the, the stability. It is asymptotically stable. That means that the error is bound, the numerical error is bound, and furthermore, the error decreases to zero as soon as you increase the size of the time step or as soon as you uh, <coughs> iterate the time step, basically. If you go, if you integrate it for a sufficiently large number of steps, the error will decrease, and then uh, your solution will converge to the uh, equilibrium solution of the problem. And this is something that you can prove basically uh, by direct calculation if you have only two species. But as soon as you have a generic system with an arbitrary number of species, it becomes more complicated because you have a matrix 
of dimension n that you need to study and you to understand how, how it behaves. And <coughs> we did that in, in the paper that we uh, published this year, was part of the, of the paper. Another thing we, we, were, we proved was the momentum conservation to machine precision. We want to un, uh, study the momentum transfer between different species, so we would like to conserve momentum, right? So that's also very important. It's something that can be proved as well for an arbitrary number of species. Uh, that's what I say, basically. And uh, we also did some tests, including nonlinear drag forces. Nonlinear means that uh, or linear means that this coefficient alpha does not depend on the velocity, basically, the collision rate. But <coughs> you can include a collision rate that is velocity dependent. And uh, we did some tests and <coughs> we recovered the solutions remarkably well. So we can use and we can study or using this uh, scheme for nonlinear uh, regimes. And <coughs> it turns out that it's uh, cheaper than an analytical method and uh, it has another advantage as well. I'm going to mention later on, but it is cheaper because if you, if you want to solve this equation, you can you, can, you, you don't need to solve it numerically in principle, right? You can solve the eigenvalue problem because <coughs> in principle, if it's linear, right? In a linear drag force regime, you can solve the the eigenvalue problem. If it's not linear, maybe you can linearize or do something else. But <coughs> if you want to do that, you need to solve an eigenvalue problem, which is it, it, it is very expensive, and you could be you condition it, but it also <coughs> you need to apply some transformations to make the system symmetric, which requires mat matrix operations. So that's also another uh, another additional computation time that you you need to <coughs> account for. So uh, we are just solving this using an inversion inversion algorithm, uh, partial pivoting with gauss Shortland method, which is turns out to or prove to be stable despite being partial. So, <coughs> so far, I only talk about the, the implicit scheme, but we would like to do some astrophysics, so we implement this method in Fargo 3D. Fargo 3D works, <coughs> as Paolo was mentioning yesterday, as an operator splitting or dimensional splitting. The idea is that you can split the momentum or continue to equation between source ter terms and advection terms. And what we did was our multiple species and <coughs> each species has some some experiment and some, some force, some Lorentz force, or pressure gradient, or or gravitational gradient. And after the velocity and the densities are uh, updated, <coughs> actually the velocity is because it's a momentum equation. You you uh, make the species interact uh, each other in the collision step, and then you add back the solution in the transport step, where you solve the continuity equation there as well. And the important thing about this is uh, this is the fashion, the right fashion to do this. Because when you organize the splitting in this way, you, are, uh, you can prove by paper and pen that this returns the right equilibrium solution of the, of the problem, the correct analytical equilibrium of the problem. And it is independent whether you use the collision when, whether you solve the collision using an implicit scheme or using an analytical method, you, in the limit, you will get the same, the same, the same result, the same equilibrium solution. And that's something that you can prove. It, it's in somehow explaining in the paper. So <coughs> that's very important because it has, this uh, satisfies a lot of important properties now. You can <coughs> be always sure that your problem will converge to the right equilibrium as a function of time. So in order to, to uh, test our method, we, we were doing a test switch. It's, it consists in something like six or five tests that are, are in the paper. I'm not going to explain all of them. I'm only going to focus on one of them that might be interesting for, for this meeting, which is the uh, radial or the <coughs> background equilibrium solutions for a protoplanetary disk when you consider some axisymmetric uh, uh, problem. And so far, I, I didn't talk about DAST. This is the first time I will introduce DAST because what we can do with this uh, method is to solve DAST, treating DAST as a pressure fluid. But I also mentioned that we can apply our framework to uh, MHD or to other species if you want to mix gases or other kind of physics. That could be done in principle. But now let's talk about DAST. So <coughs> what we did was find 
uh, the test suite consists in analytical or exact solutions for many different problems that are general for an average number of species. That was something new. And part of that is uh, a new background solution for, for this. There, there are these famous solutions from Nakagawa where you assume a Keplerian uh, background and you uh, expand <coughs> your equation assuming that the dark force is perturbation and you get on, you, you, you keep only the first order term in the velocities and then you have some solutions for, for two species. But what we did was assume that the, back, the background is for the gas is indeed sub Keplerian equilibrium, not Keplerian equilibrium. And then we, we put an arbitrary number of uh, species. And then we, after that, we find the solutions which correspond, correspond to the solid uh, black curve. On top of that, all the points correspond to the numerical solution, and different, different curves correspond to different sub backgrounds. Um, basically, what you can see, typically in the two, two fluid problems, you have that the gas is moving outward and the dust will move inward. But when you add more species, then the dust migration becomes non-trivial, and some species will follow the gas, some others will move inward. But uh, <coughs> if you change slightly the Stokes number of the mass, you can revert the migration of uh, some of uh, some of the species so in a general in a general problem you still don't know uh, where the dust is moving where each species is moving so you need to figure it out but you can do it analytically because um, the solution is uh, is in the paper so <coughs> you can use that information basically so uh, another applications to dust dynamics uh, where yesterday we were talking a lot about the stream instability today as well. So it seems like these uh, relevant topics in plant formation. So uh, we learned we learn a lot yesterday. So if <coughs> we have a, an arbitrary number of species of multi-species stream instability, we, we learned that we have a challenge now in trying to understand the dynamics of what's going on because apparently the growth rate might, might decrease with the number of species. But uh, <coughs> so the, the nonlinear evolution of the stream instability might become uh, non-trivial. But uh, that being said, we, we can uh, still study the nonlinear evolution of the stream instability and compare our results with uh, results obtained with particles, for example. So in that, in that sense, we are doing an exercise trying to validate uh, the ap approach of treating dust as a pressure fluid against uh, treating dust with particles. So the stream instability provides us a very well-defined problem to do that comparison. So we did that and we compared our results with previous one obtained by Bayan Stone in 2010, based on previous results by Sean Hansen and Judin from 2007. So we have two different cases here, uh, only one dust species. And <coughs> what we are showing is the density evolution of the dust and it's developing this characteristic of filament structure in both cases. And here we have the result from the paper, and here are the results of minus stone. And what you can see, qualitative, that they both uh, agree, right? But of course, a qualitative comparison is, is, is not enough. You want to understand quantitative what's going on. So what we did was uh, try to reproduce this cumulative uh, density distributions but we are not counting particles, we are counting cells because we are uh, treating dust as a pressure fluid. And the idea is that you, you have to <coughs> basically count the amount of cells that have a density above a given threshold. And in, in that way, you, you const construct your uh, cumulative, de cumulative density distribution. So for, for one of the cases, uh, the agreement is, is, I would say, excellent, it's remarkable. What we are doing with particles, you're doing with fluids, and this case is the larger the Stokes number. The case with has a Stokes number equals one, so it works pretty well in other. <coughs> so you don't you don't only recover the maximum densities that you can get, so all the probability distribution is also uh, the, even the shape is also uh, recovered. But when you, in the other case, <coughs> we we have a different we have a different problem. So we have some degree of agreement up to 512 square cells, but as soon as we keep increasing the the resolution, the density keeps growing. The density that you find uh, in these filaments keeps growing. So something is, is happening there. We still don't have an answer for that. I think it's quite an open question. It could be that 
the, the instability is telling us something that we yet do not, do not understand in the nonlinear regime. It could be that we are reaching some limitation in the approximation that we are doing with the dust. So <coughs> I think it would be very interesting to have a, a very well-defined problem where we can compare particles and dust with uh, uh, basically particles and pressure fluids to see uh, what are the limitations of, our appro of both approaches and uh, where we can apply one or where we can apply another one. But, but I think uh, we still don't, don't understand this and uh, there's no uh, final answer. And <coughs> just, uh, just to finish, I want to mention that uh, since the multi-fluid uh, Fargo 3D version came out like one year ago, officially public, I think six months ago, something like that, uh, a handful of paper came out so, so it turns out to be to be very useful, at least for studying different problems. There was a paper in which in where we, we studied the self-organization of the Hall effect in protoplanetary disk. Uh, we were trying to understand whether the structures that are uh, generated by the larger scale magnetic field flux concentrations eventually can trap the dust. So, <coughs> uh, another paper, another project was the. Uh, uh, the one that Pablo was mentioning during his talk, when we have the planetary migration affected by dust. There is some non-ideal MHD shock test with uh, treating the ions and the electrons separately. And also some uh, honor award for, from Philip Bieber, who is a PhD student as well in Copenhagen. And he was studying how a planet like Jupiter and Saturn, after they carve a gap, they could filter the uh, migration of the, the, the dust. They could filter how different how different uh, sizes, how different dust sizes or grain sizes could move through the gap or not. And they, they were applying some of the results to understand <coughs> some di dichotomy that exists in the solar system in the concentration of calcium uh, aluminum. And <coughs> it was also a, a very recent paper. So it, it, it looks like it, it can, be, can be very useful. And <coughs> so <coughs> as a take home message, I think uh, we have a very robust and precise and probably perhaps one of the most efficient schemes to simulate multi-species system. And I will, I will let this as, uh, I think, as one of the open question of one of, uh, I think one of the things that we would like to have in the future, which is a framework, for example, where we could include pressure fluids and particles and try to understand the limitation of the bo both approaches and when we can apply one regime, when we can apply the other one, depending on the physics. So, so the fact that we prove basically that the multi-fluid project works very well, it doesn't mean that it can be applied to any different problem, right? Every, uh, every problem we have a different condition for that, and you need to understand very carefully if the pressure fluid approach could be used there or not. And <coughs> another thing that could be interesting to see whether when you go to a regime where uh, particles the crossing orbit of the particles dominate the dynamics, where you can find uh, an effect, when you can measure whether you can measure a velocity dispersion, and try to find an effective pressure that you can use in the pressure fluid approximation to see if you can recover the dynamics of the particles there. So um, that, that's that's all. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we have time for just a couple of questions, uh, Simeon. Interesting. So I'm, I'm not quite clear on the operator split approach. So the collision operator, if you so that's implicit, if you take an enormous, enormously large time step, that will result in all the velocities of the species being the same, right? Because that's the only equilibrium solution. So, so mm -hmm. how can you then, rip because that step doesn't know about all the sources, so how do you get the... So, so that step, uh, the, the way in which implemented, because it's affected by the source, when you do it, uh, you, that step accounts for the acceleration, uh, accounts for the new velocity that you are uh, obtaining from the source step. So basically, you, you have a... You can you have a source step that will update the velocities, and then you have some accelerations, and you can think that some some constant acceleration that you have now in the collisions, and then you can solve the system taking account for that. So you can I can show maybe I can show you that with with 
how we do it with, uh, with pen and paper, but the code is doing that. So the operating split it is, is taking care of, of that the, your conversion to an equilibrium, which is given by the implicit solver, but is affected by the acceleration of the source step. So when you do when you do the calculation, you can prove that you are converging to the equilibrium of the problem, basically, not the equilibrium that gives give you only the implicit solver. And that is because the velocities will have some uh, will be affected by the sour step. So, so I didn't put the, the full equations with the full operator split in the linear, but uh, yeah, it can it can be done. Uh. I'm afraid uh, I just need uh, one very quick question and very quick answer because we are running out of time. Okay, this is a very quick question. On the the one that didn't give the same as Bion Stone, what was the difference in parameters compared to the one that did? So the Stokes, Stokes number was smaller. Oh, okay. so that was small Stokes number. Yeah, was point one. And it was a was bit more smaller. massive. Okay. The, the 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 epsilon was a bit larger. Okay. But the Stokes number was smaller. Was point one. Right. So the one so degree has larger stock number. So with these two points, we don't really know yeah. yet what causes mm -hmm. these differences or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks again, uh, Leonardo. We can move on.